Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Today on the Another View Roundtable, Hollywood's take on being black in America. The movie Green Book pretends African Americans and whites can learn to get along if we just spend time together. While the movie The Hate You Give delves into the double life many African Americans live as they navigate black and white worlds. And then there's a black community divided around the allegations of pedophilia by R&B star R. Kelly. The docuseries Surviving R. Kelly has the community in an uproar. We'll talk about all of this, plus the latest on the government shutdown and the wall. The Another View Roundtable is next. Stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. So glad that you're spending this hour with us today because we've got a lot to talk about. I've got our all-female Another View roundtable here with <laughs> us today. But before we get started, I want to talk to you about something very, very serious. And ladies that are listening that are 40 years old or older and do not have health insurance... Okay, please listen. There is a free mammogram screening. Centera Norfolk General Comprehensive Breast Center, EVMS Department of Surgery and Medical Center radiologists are collaborating to provide free mammograms to uninsured women 40 and over. Now, they have several slots that are open. Um, this is going to be on the 21st of January. That's when registration is by the 21st of January. Here's the phone number to call. 757-388-2062, 757-388-2062. You must be registered by the 21st of this month in order to participate. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this is something that is very, very important, particularly in the African-American community. Women are all over, but definitely in the African-American community, get screened Find out what's happening with your body, okay? That phone number again, 757-388-2062. Now, in order to qualify, you must be a resident of Chesapeake, Newport News, Norfolk, or Portsmouth. And that's because in those areas, the um, uh, rate of breast cancer is highest in this area. So Chesapeake, Newport News, Norfolk, or Portsmouth resident, and um, they will, and you're 40 years or older, and you don't have insurance, you can qualify to get a free mammogram. So please pay attention. Give the phone number a call if you have any questions, 757-388-2062. So being African-American, according to Hollywood and the government shutdown over the wall are their topics for the Another View Roundtable. So let's go ahead and meet our pundits. She's our favorite relationship expert and co-host of the podcast Love Life, Ms. Alvian Lyons. Hey, Alvian. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so glad that you're here with us today. Me too. Don Hester, it keeps the money straight in the city of Norfolk. Please welcome <laughs> city treasurer Don Hester. And Don, um, you might want to say something also about this mammogram. Screening yes, and how I'm critical so it is. You, you need to put your mic down so we can okay, hear you. There you go. I'm trying to drink water and everything else. Hey, everybody. Um, yes, you know, I just hit my 15 year mark, had my mammogram scheduled for next week. And so, if you don't have insurance, please take advantage of this. Absolutely. Even if you have insurance, make sure you get your mammogram. Absolutely. Um, the early detection you makes a difference in, in living and your quality of life. So Dawn has to 15 years it. free, mm -hmm. breast cancer free. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So share That's the information, fantastly. please. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You're welcome. And also joining us is comedian extraordinaire, Ms. Allison Moore. Hey, Allison. Hey. How you doing? Doing good. Good, good. So, I know we want to talk about the whole pop culture and the movies thing, mm -hmm. and there's a lot going going on with that but let's first start with today is day 21 of the where shutdown. we of the government shutdown mm -hmm. this is the day that we tie for the longest government shutdown in history mm -hmm. so which means tomorrow will be will be the, the longest <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so um the president says now he's thinking very seriously about going around the uh, uh, Congress mm -hmm. and declaring a national emergency. Um, what do you think it's going to take to break the stalemate? I'm going to start with you, Don, on this one because you you've been in politics. And okay, <laughs> I'm going to say this: <laughs> it takes an elected official to hear from their constituents 
in order to move off a dime. So everybody needs to be calling. Whether mm-hmm. you're Democrat or Republican, you need to be calling your elected representative in the Senate and in the House and the president. Blow up the line. We blew up the line with the children when we did the, you know, had the tragedies with gun violence. We mm-hmm. marched. We got to blow up the phone lines. We blew up the phone lines with health care. So we know, got to blow up the phone lines. So why are we so acquiescing on this issue? I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, federal workers can't really do much. I thought that was really interesting because the laws them. impact them. And yeah. also, now I noticed that the, the union, those that are unionized have started to, to protest more publicly. Because I, right. I, that struck me that the workers were not out there protesting. But, Alvin. Well, I think that this is a very interesting and profoundly telling moment in our nation, particularly for those because we we know in terms of the electorate that Trump won a significant margin of working white class Americans. And for whatever reason, he pulled the most incredible kabuki theater and magic show ever to be able to convert a billionaire into the voice for the working class. But I think that this is the moment when all of the sheets come off and we get to see what's behind the emperor's clothes because the fact that he is so indifferent about workers being able to receive their paychecks is the ultimate indication of what happens when you're orienting from a place of privilege. When you are a billionaire, it's not a big deal to you to miss a paycheck or two because you have no frame of reference for what the working class really experience. You can do all the rhetoric in the world, but quite frankly, you have no concept of what it really means to not get your paycheck. And so this is when we get to find out, do you really understand the working class? And if anything, if anything is more indicative that he does not. This moment is the moment that you know that it was all just sound bites. He doesn't have any idea what's happening at your kitchen table or in your house. Allison, do you think it's fair that that the the people who can afford it the least are the ones who are affected the most by this wall that has really nothing to do with everybody else's everyday living, even though they try to claim that it does? No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, I. As you all know, as I shared on the show, you know, I'm I'm new to this world and <laughs> being accountable. Oh, I didn't tell you. I stayed up. I watched the president's address. Listen, had my oh, kids. Yeah. Us millennials, we're coming you to the table. I love and, it. We, and I paid attention the whole time. Mm-hmm. Mm. I said, it's not right. Too, it's not right. We took mm-hmm. notes. Mm-hmm. Made the kids take so notes. What, so what did you think after you heard his speech? I, well, I thought, I, you know, from the beginning, from his whole fear you know, we're we're hurting people if this doesn't, you know, you're going to die if we won't we'll get this wall up. It was like, wow, that's a really interesting way to lead. And by interesting, I mean terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, just being able to have that conversation with the kids and then being able to see. So we, st- we I don't know what channel we was watching. That's too mm-hmm. much. We, you know, okay. Baby steps. I just know we watched the TV <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was the one my husband put it on. So the Democrats, because they came up afterwards with the lady and the man all serious. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they said, yes. you know, uh-huh. this is not right. To <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we watched Clint that too. Mm-hmm. Chuck okay, Schumer. Good. Yep. And mm-hmm. Nancy Pelosi. But, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because when you really think about it, <laughs> this whole idea of eliminating black and brown people mm-hmm. from this country. I mean, it is that really that to me that is the overall message. Or oh, you know, forget all the rest of the rhetoric. You're talking about building a wall on the southern borders. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not talking about Canada. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about people you know bringing in drugs from mm-hmm. from the north. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking about where black and brown people live. Well, and I mean, he made that very clear when he referred to Haiti as an S hole country okay Mm -hmm. and why don't we get more immigration coming from the netherlands and and switzerland and so he was the distinction was unequivocally a color-based or cultural-based distinction and i was just having a conversation with my team on the way here and they were referencing some articles that they had recently read um and one referenced the united states one referenced the uk but speaking to the same study saying that Americans, one of the studies indicated that Americans were not having children at the same birth rate, the level that they used to. Mm-hmm. But the UK study said, no, white women are not having children at the same 
birth at the same level that they used to, which was to suggest that there was some kind of emergency. Now, America referenced it as if it was an American issue. But no, quite frankly, it's a white American issue that the population of white Americans is steadily declining because less white women are having children at the rates they used to. Mm -hmm. But brown and black women are having children at even higher rates than they used to, which just do the math means that what our country is going to look like in 30 years is getting tanner and tanner and tanner. So if I can't increase the number of children being made inside of the country, then my next best alternative is to reduce the number of brown children coming into the country. So we do have a there's a cultural emergency. There's an ethnic emergency. It's not about whether or not we have drugs pouring in because they are they told him when he went to go visit the border that they've built tunnels. So the the wall isn't going to protect you from tunnels. And not only that, but they're also saying that most of the drugs come in from, from the from, from the from they're the actually ports. coming from oh, yeah. the they're ports. coming in legally yeah. they're yeah. coming they're from coming the ports. in legally so yeah. so th- I'm, there's no question about the fact that we're having a we're having a conversation that <laughs> is really not about what we're talking about mm-hmm. yeah but, and you know but the president we've always known what his position is on people of color yeah i mean he learned that from his father and it's just continued so we know that my concern is about the senate and that body that is doing nothing. Because, I mean, the way the government is supposed to work with the three branches is that they're supposed to balance each other. And when the the um, um, Speaker of the Senate mm-hmm. says, um, uh, Mitch McConnell says, I'm not going to bring any bill to the Senate that I know the president is not going to sign off on, mm-hmm. that automatically takes two of those and puts them together. Right. And it makes no sense because... The president doesn't have to sign it. If they agree to it and it sits 10 days, it's law Mm -hmm. without his signature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk to Richard in Newport News. Hi, Richard. You're on the air. Good afternoon, ladies. I want to hear the other side of the story. And there's three parts to this. There's individual responsibility. You have to save for a rainy day. If you're an employee at a company and you know it can shut down, this happens periodically. (laughs) That's individual responsibility. And number two, as far as defense and, and tunneling under, well, what if you put up an eight-foot fence, can any of you guys there to station, I mean, let's be honest, can you climb an eight- or ten-foot fence? No. So you're going to dig a tunnel. Well, how long does that take? Everybody's got a fence, but nobody's but the fences don't work. You, you can't have it both ways. Okay, Richard, thanks. I'll let the, the group respond to you. Um, in terms of everyone having individual responsibility, Richard's point, I guess, is that you should be prepared for something like this. And so if you don't get a paycheck, it shouldn't be a big deal, Don. Okay. Um, and yes, I believe that people should be responsible for their households. And yes, we are saving for a rainy day. But when you don't know how long the rainy day is going to last, how do you prepare when you that? don't know... If you're going to be able to go out and find some work, when the federal government has stated that you cannot work a mm-hmm. part-time job in some instances for some of the individuals who are furloughed right now, mm-hmm. what do you do? So my rainy day is for a crisis in my household. My rainy day is not for a crisis in the country that is being um talked about in a manner that's going to affect my life because that's a lie Mm -hmm. so so, but think about allison the the whole gig economy for example because not everyone has an opportunity to work a nine to five government job right you know and get paid on a regular basis those people who do have that privilege still may have issues within their household that doesn't allow them to have a huge rainy day fund yeah and and I mean, I understand what he's saying, but my I, I have a gig profession, but my husband doesn't. And in June, we had a house fire and we lost everything. So there went our rainy day. So mm-hmm. I can't afford for him. He we we cannot not have a paycheck, sir. Sorry. And mm-hmm. I think that that's kind of what happens for 50, 60, 75 percent of people. Yeah, we all say we save for a rainy day, but that's not your decision to make. Or for you to say, you know, well, look, why, why don't you have your savings account? Why isn't mm-hmm. your savings account set up for t- to not have a paycheck for 21 days? And and that's it's 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 a slap it's in the face to me. To me, yeah, to make the comment. 
about what's in my household. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I am responsible for my household, doing the best that I can with what I have. But when rainy day issues hit, then you work through that in your home. Mm-hmm. This is not is a, this rainy a rainy day, day right. issue. That, I was going to say, that's this like a, a blown tire transmission. This is a national crisis that, you know, nobody looked to, thought would come, and you can't prepare for that because you don't know how long it's going to be shut down when you have somebody who will not negotiate with but you. But there's a difference there is just, uh-huh. just in uh-huh. terms of parallel. Obvious. There's a real difference between a rainy day is like having a spare tire in your trunk. That's, mm-hmm. That's appropriate. We're all supposed to have a spare tire in our trunk. But there's a difference between that and buying a car that they did not actually put all the pieces that were supposed to be necessary inside of that engine. And as a result, you're driving something with the confidence that it's going to function even with your tire in the back seat. You you cannot, or in your trunk, you cannot prepare for something that you had no idea was getting ready to happen to you. So I think that, and in, in considering how many, the, the ripple effect that this is going to have, that you're also talking about a rainy day now for renters. You're talking about a rainy day for the owners of the rental property. You're talking about a rainy day for... <coughs> government employees or contractors. You're talking about a rainy day for TSA. People who can't even leave the job to go get another job because they're obligated to stay on the job and work for free. Our military is hit significantly where these things are concerned. So the people who protect and care about us the most, who ensure our safety, are the people who are getting hit the hardest. And I think that that is fundamentally un-American. We're supposed to take care of the people who take care of us. I thought it was really interesting, too. I heard this morning that the FBI, for example, um, you cannot be hired as an FBI agent if you have bad credit. Yep. So there are agents now that they're saying if this continues It'll affect for a long time, it's going to affect their That's credit. Exactly right. And they may lose their jobs. Absolutely. They may actually lose their jobs. Those who protect this. and serve are getting hit the hardest. And I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Don. I just wanted to speak to, to the underground tunnel piece because I don't okay. want to leave okay. that out with this wall thing. Okay. Um, the tunnels are already there. New tunnels are being built. Yes, it takes a long time to build a tunnel, but the tunnels have been working all along. So, you know, you can't just do, which I think is the argument that's trying to be made. There are different ways to secure our borders Mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And that's really from the air with the drones and with more people to be able to interact. Because the people who are on the ground, they know where the people are coming in through. Mm -hmm. So... You know, let's work it from that way. And I don't like the fact that we'll be taking somebody's land to build a wall. And my issue is that how, how, how we're distinguishing what's a national emergency. Because when you actually look at the statistics, the greatest national emergencies we're suffering are homegrown. They are not what's happening coming across the border. So are we saying that it's okay for us to harm people within our own home, but it's not okay for people to harm us that don't live inside of our home? So uh, the truth is, if we're going to address security and issue and safety, that means both domestic and international. Mm -hmm. But we can't ignore domestic, which far surpasses at a four or five time rate, far surpasses what's happening domestically to talk about what's happening internationally. If what we're saying is that this is an emergency like an ER. You take care of the gunshot wound before you take care of the fractured ankle. They all matter. But let's be honest, numerically, what we're deciding to put our attentions on, it is not based on the numbers. Okay. Did Heather, uh, let's go to Heather. Uh, Heather on line three. Hi, Heather. You're on the air. Hello, Heather. Are you there? Heather changed her mind. Uh, I guess maybe Heather okay. changed her mind. Well, you know what? I'm then if that's the case, I'm going to move on to our next topic because we have a lot to talk about we in do. terms of pop culture and what is happening oh, yeah. with that. Um, callers, if you're trying to call us at four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero, be patient with us. We may be having a little bit of problems with our phone lines, um, so we're working on that. But the phone number is four four zero two six six or 1-800-940-2240. So African-Americans are being portrayed on the big and small screen. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the small screen and the issue that has the black community all up in arms. The Lifetime docuseries Surviving R. Kelly. 
In it, several women tell the story of being sexually abused by R&B singer Robert Kelly when they were teenagers, some as young as 14 years old. There's a movement afoot, uh, hashtag mute to R. Kelly, which has been able to prevent him from performing. Yet since the docuseries has aired, the numbers, streaming numbers of his music have increased. And there are many in the black community who defend him. Let's take a listen to a clip first, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. There's a difference between R.A. Kelly and Robert. R.A. Kelly's this fun, laughing, loving guy. But Robert is the devil. Is the devil. Is the devil. R. Kelly is at the top of the charts, but he may be in for a fall. He was arrested today on 21 counts of child pornography. Kelly is accused of videotaping himself having sex with an underage girl. Taking advantage of minors will not be tolerated. Jurors found him not guilty on all charges. Robert has said all along he would be clear to these terrible charges. Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! Milk R. Kelly! Milk Kelly! R. Kelly has denied accusations that he's holding women against their will in a sex cult. He gave said he loved you so much. I should have never introduced her to him. I should have never introduced my family. <laughs> He's the puppet master. It was very scary because I knew at that moment I had a secret. Sparkle is alleged to have received significant payment. I didn't take the money because I can't be bought. He ain't a monster by himself. It took some help. I was just ready to get the hell out of there. Black women don't get the same recognition as our white counterparts. And I wish that would change. A grown man, 50-something years old. That's not acceptable. Nowhere. Nowhere. Now, Allison, you wrote me a note when the documentary aired, and um, you had some really strong feelings about this from a millennial perspective, but no, from your own personal perspective. Talk to me about that. So I remember, the I think it was the first panel that I had, and, uh-huh. and I was coming from my birthday party or something, and yep. the topic came up, and I remember you asked me, but did you listen? Are you also listening to R. Kelly? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, we still listen to a couple of the songs. <laughs> Pull your mic and up a bit, I knew then... You know, I just felt this place of like, oh, come on, come on, you got to mm-hmm. come higher. Mm-hmm. And with the docuseries, which I didn't watch it, but I heard enough about it and was able to, you just got to be accountable. And at the end of the day, we knew coming up, you know, I'm 35. Mm-hmm. And so that Aaliyah, when he got married to Aaliyah when she was younger, whatever, but we were teens ourselves. So I think we kind of just dismissed it as she was messing with an older guy and it, it's, I have a daughter now, so I'm like, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. She 13. Mm-hmm. So, so you're saying this grown man, like, kid. Mm-hmm. And, and I think now that I'm an adult, it feels different. It looks different. It's not okay. But I wasn't, I didn't shift to my adult mindset. I was still taking on my, I was 16 when our favorite R. Kelly songs were coming out. Mm-hmm. And it was one or two people that, you know, were affected, kind of, so to speak. But th- there is a level of, you got to denounce it, like, it's it's not okay. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear R. Kelly music. There are a million other artists. He do, you know to separate the artist from the music. But in his music, he talks about he's the Pied Piper. Which back in the, we never researched Pied Piper. I never. I, so you he, didn't get get. The I didn't connection. even get the like. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's been telling us he was sick the whole time. Age ain't nothing but a number. We were teens, so we're thinking that's right. I'm 13, but I should really be 17. Like no, that's not what that means. And so there's a level of accountability there. I saw on Facebook, Alvian, um, a lot of discussion about whether or about there was one person put on there. Um, I don't see documentaries about Harvey Weinstein or I don't see documentaries about Charlie Rose. So therefore, why are you picking on the black man? Okay, and so <laughs> which just blew my mind. To, I have to admit, I was had, just I, so were saying I, that with Bill Cosby too. So I have issue with that on multiple levels. See, I'm not looking for. And it's the same thing when people say that. Well, you know, we don't have to worry about what it is that cops are doing to black Americans, given what black Americans are doing to black Americans. Okay, I have the same issue with that argument because, quite frankly, crime is crime. I don't care who's doing it who's doing it and it doesn't make it 
okay to have more allegiance to color than it does to to more to have more allegiance to character Mm -hmm. there's a certain character if you are willing to use the color factor in order to excuse criminal activity then you are not governed by any real principles you just are you it's it's like being part of a gang i'm just going to stay loyal because we're both black or we're both white or we're both wearing blue or we both have the badge those that's not how morality is determined why why we don't get enough attention as people of color when issues happen or we get too much attention when issues happen those those speak to systemic issues there's no question about it mm-hmm. but individually we should have concern with we should be glad that women of color who are being abused by someone in power whether he's black or white is finally are finally getting an opportunity for there to be attention paid Mm -hmm. because our lives do matter Mm -hmm. and that injustice does matter should harvey and everybody else be on it too fine Mm -hmm. so i'm absolutely everybody needs to be exposed but that doesn't mean that this person should not be exposed because they have not effectively been. Hang on one second. If you're just joining us, we're talking about current events, including the government shutdown and being black as portrayed by Hollywood with our Another View Roundtable pundits, relationship expert Alvian Lyons, Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester and comedian Allison Moore. Don, your take on, did you see it? Have no. You, seen, you didn't see it? No, I didn't see it. And I'm the old one at this table. <laughs> and um, no, and you know, I've never been an R. Kelly fan. Mm hmm. But um, we as women um, um, have to be more assertive when we reach a certain point in our life to affect change in our life and the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is occurring Mm -hmm. now. Because even before the documentary, the women were coming together once they were finding out who was who and what was what. And I think that the the lawsuits and the court cases that are going to come from it, um, even if he decides to sue Lifetime for the documentary, I think that the voices are going to be heard and they can't be put back in a back door anymore. Absolutely. Um, I do think, though, that we, too, need to have the discussion about some of the women and choices that family members may have mm-hmm. made. Mm-hmm regarding them at that time because of the celebrity status, the money, things of that nature. We got to talk about and that. And you know, it's interesting. What was mind blowing to me also is that a lot of these women, when they were paid to keep quiet, they weren't paid Very mega much. dollars. No. There was one that was only paid a hundred dollars. I well, mean, <laughs> but th- that's too, because of the value that we put on ourselves mm-hmm. yeah. and expectations and not knowing mm-hmm. And, you know, if this person is providing you with all of these things, then you think that little bit is a lot. And for your life, and we don't know everybody's circumstance, might have been. You know. You know what also concerned me, though, that more so, and I did watch it because I knew we were going to be talking about it today. And so I did a binge watch, which was... I, I can't oh, even sure. imagine watching, you know, six days in a row, and I watched it all in one evening. <laughs> it was overload, believe me. But... The gentlemen who were, and I use that term loosely. Very loosely. Who were surrounding him and enabling were complicit. him in this in, in Absolutely. these alleged activities. Absolutely. Um, and I and was, women. Uh, yes. There and were women, women also. And there too. were women too. Who um but but when his his um personal assistant slash manager who's in the documentary and mm-hmm. he says in the documentary yes I used to go to the mall and I would be the one to go over to these young girls mm-hmm. you know 13 14 years old and I would be the one to tell them come on over R. Kelly wants to meet you mm-hmm. you know um, I was the one who helped forge the documents for Aaliyah and him right. to get married saying that she was 18 when she was 15 years old right. how old is your daughter Allison? 13 13 13 so, I mean, can you imagine? Oh, yeah, so he should go to jail, too. Agreed. I think My there's point. some charges that bring brought up against him now. Agreed. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And and the, the um, uh, district attorneys in Illinois and in Atlanta yes. have both called for people to step forward um, right. and to see. Um, you know, it, he used a very interesting tactic the first time he went to court, which was delaying mm-hmm. the court 
try the trial as long as he could, which and then they had a juror on there who actually stated, you know, I just didn't believe the women. When, and women well, are the, women are actually the worst when it comes to the belief of other women, which is really something that we have to examine as a gender. I mean, the fact that we literally I, let me not get too far into that. Okay. But I mean, like we just we have to examine what it is that we do to each other on a regular basis. And, and I, we are tougher on each other than we are on on men and how men are with each other. We are the quickest to say that, oh, she's fast. Oh, she asked for it. Oh, she she probably signed up for this, that or the other. Or it, it didn't happen to me. So I don't I don't believe that it happened. Or I would have mm-hmm. never put myself mm-hmm. in that situation. Mm-hmm. And then we start the victim blaming at a, at a gender level. So during our production meeting this morning, Lisa brought up the question of can you separate the art from the artist? No, I can't. Personally, mm-hmm. I stopped listening to R. Kelly when the Aaliyah stuff happened. So, which I said, you know, mm-hmm. during the last show that we were on together, mm-hmm. I, I can't, I barely listened to Michael Jackson. So like it just, and while he was not convicted of anything and there was, you know, conversation about it, it still makes me a little uneasy because I'm a parent. So I just principally cannot do that. So I, mm-hmm. I cannot, the only thing I can separate is that if he wrote songs for other people and they perform those songs, I don't have issue with that in terms of muting them and their songs because he sold a product to them. But in terms of having him perform and supporting him directly, I absolutely draw the line where that's concerned. Where that's concerned. What about Mute you, Don? Mute the pocketbook. Mute the pocketbook. If you stop listening to him, stop streaming, don't give him any more money. Mm-hmm. It makes a difference. I mean, you know, I probably shouldn't think this way, but I do. So hurt his pocketbook. Absolutely. Just hurt his pocketbook. He got enough in there. You're thinking yeah. just right. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Allison? Can you separate the art from the artist? Depending on the art and the artist. I mean, depending on the situation. So like in this case, absolutely not. But there are some offenses or that I don't think are egregious enough for me to not deal with you know there's some people that may not want to listen to my comedy because i've done xyz one two three Mm -hmm. so i think that there is a level and it's specific to whatever the circumstance is and Mm -hmm. so i can't separate r kelly and his situation i can't separate bill cosby and his stuff but i might i can separate brandy Mm -hmm. and she you know she hit someone with a kill somebody with her car so it just to me depends on the circumstances, depends on the circumstances. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't okay. listen to Chris Brown after he beat up Rihanna so I just I mean it just really depends on what principles govern you and what's negotiable and what's not negotiable for you Okay. Mm-hmm. Green Book the story of classical and jazz pianist Dr. Dur- Donald Shirley and his relationship with his chauffeur Tony Vella- Vellalonga or Tony Lip in the movie, as, as he was more affectionately known I guess it won a best picture award at the Golden Globe one of the screenwriters is Tony Vellalonga's son and written and the, the uh, play, I mean, the movie, excuse me, was written based on stories his dad told him. And it has been soundly criticized as a white savior movie and by the Shirley family as complete fiction. Mm. So let's listen to a trailer and then we'll talk from there. Yeah. Some guy called over here, a doctor. He's looking for a driver. You interested? I am not a medical doctor. I'm a musician. I'm about to embark on a concert tour in the Deep South. What other experience do you have? Public relations. Do you foresee any issues in working for a black man? You in the Deep South? There's going to be problems. Tell me that don't smell good. I've never had fried chicken in my life. You people love the fried chicken. You have a very narrow assessment of me, Tony. Yeah, right? I'm good. You will be interacting with some of the wealthiest people in the country. It is my feeling that your addiction Oof. could use some finessing. Fana, but why are you breaking my balls? Because you can do better, Mr. Balalonga. You don't know your own people. You, Mr. Big Shot, doing concerts for rich people. So if I'm not black enough, and if I'm not white enough, then tell me, Tony, what am I? Won't you tell me? Anyone can sound like Beethoven. But your music, what you do, only you can do that. So did you guys see it? I did not. You have not seen it. I have not. Ah. My brother has seen it twice and said, you better go see it. (laughs) (laughs) It's on my list, but I I did not. I actually, you know, which we're getting ready to discuss soon, but I was working on making sure I saw the hate you give. The hate you give, yes. So we're going to talk about that (laughs) in just a moment. Um, Well, I will say this about the movie because I did see it. Um, As a matter of fact, I've seen it twice. And I get 
it's very interesting to me that there's more criticism from African American critics, movie critics, mm -hmm. than there appear to be from white critics. Mm -hmm. um, the whole white savior um, personification, if, if you will, where they talk about the fact that um, it is presented that this man changed Dr. Donald Shirley's life as, as opposed, opposed to, to the, the other, other way, way around. around. I get what you're saying. And you know what? It was it, What I found most interesting was this. It's a very interesting movie, and it was a feel-good movie. Mm -hmm. When I left the first time from the theater, I was like, okay, cool. This was this was mm -hmm. a good a feel-good movie. Having heard now what the family is saying, no one consulted his family about it. They about this. This was all done from Tony Velo, uh, Vellalonga's perspective. Is the family getting paid? The family is not getting paid. The family what? is not was not consulted oh. in terms of of whether or not any of this actually happened, even though it's presented as a true story. Wow! In the movies, and the family says that in fact, um, the. Uh, you know, it is in, in the movie, it is present, presented that he was estranged. Dr. Shirley was estranged from his family. Mm -hmm. He actually has five brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. They were all close. Mm -hmm. He's a, the product of a two parent home where you got the impression in the movie that he wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, they said he certainly knew what fried chicken was all about <laughs> because his father was a minister. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they were an upper middle class family, family. Interesting. And, and he was a child prodigy musician who was sent overseas and never quite got the opportunity to perform classical music, which is really what he wanted to do. And all the record companies and all kept steering him towards uh, popular music mm -hmm. um, in order for him to make a living. And so he never quite got that opportunity to be that classical um, person. Um that he really and, desired and to that he really right. desired Okay, to so now I won't yeah. go see it because I won't <laughs> spend the money for someone else to get the money. Yeah, it was... And so I wait as a matter till of fact, it's um, free on the TV. <laughs> Mashallah <laughs> um, Ali actually called the family to apologize because he said had he known that there was still family... Because Dr. Shirley died in 1980. Right. Uh, um, mm. 86 no no 20 um 2013 okay um he was and he was 86 years old and he said had he known that there was still family there he would have contacted them because he wanted to portray him in a way that was authentic Got that it. don't make any sense you're supposed to do your research. Right. You can go on Lexus Nexus and find anybody. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's me, so. Lexus Nexus. If you can go on the phone or whatever, exactly. you know, to find exactly. people. No. Exactly. The hate you, okay. The hate you give. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the powerful story of a young uh, high school girl, Star Carter, played by uh, Amanda uh, Stenberg, who lives in Garden Heights, a, a black neighborhood in Los Angeles, and goes to a predominantly white prep school because her parents want her to have a great education. She walks a five line keeping her personal life personal as she doesn't want her white friends to know she lives in the hood but then she and a friend are stopped by police and things go south and the friend is killed by the officer and she must make a choice take a stand for her friend and protest his death or remain quiet so that her white friends remain unaware of her true identity it's the whole idea of code switching of living in two worlds um, let's listen to a quick quick clip and then we'll take it from there what do you think it means? I think it's about us. Us who? Black people. Poor people, everybody at the bottom. All right, you want it? Pac was trying to school us on how the system's designed against us. Why else you think so many people in our neighborhood deal? They need the money. Yeah. And they no real jobs around here. So they fall into the trap. So Thug Life, which is what they're talking about, uh, Tupac Secure, mm -hmm. said the hate you, you give infants mm -hmm. at, ruins everyone. Ruins everyone. Let's he used use the a word ruin. Right. He exactly. used a more colorful word. <laughs> he used a more for colorful ruin. word. And mm -hmm. that's what, what the acronym <laughs> for Thug Life is all about. Did you guys get a chance to see that? You I saw it, Alvin. I absolutely Alvia. did. Okay. I did. I actually saw it yesterday. And I, I have to say that one of the things that I was saddened about personally is that it did not have the same level of impact on me that I think it would have had had we not been through so much in our nation relative to um, these two worlds, these varying perspectives, looking at 
police violence in particular. All right. So mm-hmm. I when you live it so much, the personal impact is not quite the same because this is this is what you're watching every day. And as a parent of color raising a young teenage black boy Everything that happened inside of that movie in terms of the conversations that have to be had, the preparation that is necessary, all of those things are things that happen inside of my household. I remember my parents having those conversations with my brothers and the fact that I'm still having those conversations with my son. And when his best friend comes over every once in a while, because for those of you who are not familiar with men of color, sometimes when they're working to smooth their hair, they may wear what they call a wave cap going to sleep. And it keeps your hair very soft and in place. And my my bro, my son's best friend will sometimes come down the stairs, prepare to walk out the door with the wave cap on to get behind the wheel to go drive somewhere. And I insist he takes it off because I am afraid of how he will be perceived. They will not see you as the college bound individual that you are. They will not know that you have a 3.5 GPA. They will not have any idea that you are headed to med school or a doctoral program. All they will see is a used car, which is what your family could afford, and a wave cap. Mm -hmm. And that will change the trajectory of the interaction. And those are the kinds of messages that were embedded inside of that movie that were fueling the dialogue in ways that every family of color has either had a loved one, a brother, a sister, an uncle, a child, that they've been part of these conversations that are really about how to survive in America when you are black. Mm -hmm. And that is that's still tough to deal with. But it's such a reality that I don't know that it would have that it had exactly the impact it would have had if I wasn't living it every day. Interesting. Did you see it, Allison? No, I didn't. And I'm embarrassed that I didn't because just even in my filmmaking world, I made sure make sure to go to see every black if it's a black lead or a black director that I'm there or I'm giving my money if I don't want to see the movie. And in this case, I made sure that some people bought some tickets, but I didn't go. see. But you didn't get to see it yourself. Let's talk to Greg from Hampton. Hi, Greg. You're on the air. Greg, are you there? Yes. I am glad Hi. to be here. <laughs> We're glad to have you <laughs> on here. So now I understand you and Alvin are friends and that you um you saw the movie too and you may have a little different perspective on it. I do. Uh as a Caucasian that grew up in a basically fifty fifty black and white high school here in Hampton, um, I really felt like in in many ways that I did not have any hidden prejudice that I really didn't. I was over any prejudice that I might've had when I was growing up that I was taught by my father and taught by the white culture that I grew up in, especially as a younger kid. Um, And so this movie opened up my eyes in a way to really begin to understand, because I do not believe I understand, but it opened up my eyes to begin to understand the plight of, the young black male, especially in the United States. And I, I, I understood it could be a problem, but I am now more convinced that it is a problem in America. Mm. And there is a difference and there is a difference in the way that our young people are seen and viewed if they are people of color. Greg, I'm curious, what, what can you talk, point to something in the movie um, or what made kind of what was going through your mind as you're watching this that, it's, that has helped you make that turn? Well, it's um, when you when you look at what happened to the young man and, and it, it was shot and, and killed, he was not a perfect kid. I, I was a bad kid, but I, I got away with things as a bad white kid that uh, I believe that African Americans would not get away with, and that was that was very uh, disconcerting to me. And and I have a uh, one of my best friends is an African American doctor, and when I was talking to him about this, because I really would talk more to my white friends about this, and said you've got to see this movie, and I encouraged my white friends to see this, and I posted on Facebook saying every white person in America should see this movie. You know, my my good friend said, I mean, this is a guy's much more educated than I am. And and, and, and and this this white doctor, I mean, African-American doctor said to me, he said, you know, when I was teasing him, I hadn't even brought the movie up to him. I, I was mm-hmm. teasing him about why are you driving a Prius station wagon 
And why'd you get out of your Mercedes? And why are you driving a Prius station wagon? And I don't drive a Mercedes. It's not that I think it's important to drive one, but he did. And I, and I said, you're still in that Prius. And he said, yeah, I got tired of being stopped by the police. Mm. And he bought a car that would minimize the chances of him getting stopped as an African-American in the United States. Well, I never get stopped by the police. I, I I drive in a way that I probably should get stopped every day, but I, I, I don't get stopped. And it, that, that was an additional impact on me about the same time as I saw the movie. So what did your white friends say when you said every white person should see this movie in America? I mean, what, I'm always curious when, when people talk about another view they, and they're um, non-African Americans, they say, it's an opportunity for me to hear a conversation as if I was, you know, like in the corner and nobody could see me, but it, I'm exposed to a conversation I've never heard. I'm curious as to what you all would say about a movie like The Hate You Give. Well, some people said, well, you know, again, because it was in a, the pub, most public way I said all of the white sure. people should watch this movie was in on, on Facebook. So some of the, the dumbest comments that I saw was, you know, why shouldn't black people see it? Why should only white people see it? Well, <laughs> just like Alvin said a few minutes ago, as a black person that has lived this, it wasn't that impactful. It was like normal. And I felt like that for African-Americans, it would be more normal. It would be, oh, yeah, you know, you're know, you not telling me anything I don't already understand or know. But as a white person, that movie told me something that I really don't think I knew. I heard it. I heard mm. the black perspective. But when I lived it in the movie theater, I lived it in a different way than just hearing my friends talk about it. Wow, that's awesome. Well, Greg, thanks so much for the call. We really appreciate hearing from Thank you. Thank you for and I calling, get, Van. Yeah, I want to get uh, some uh, perspective from our, our panelists here. So we wish you well. Take care. So, Don, Thank what do you, you think about that when you hear that? Pull your mic down so we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I don't cough in it. Um, I, I was, I'm grateful for that call. Mm-hmm. Caller, mm-hmm. grateful for his post. Hope. His circle of friends will follow up and view. Um, But it goes back to the conversation of building relationships. If I don't have a relationship with white people, and when I say relationship, I'm talking about a friendship. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the one, you know, one that Mm -hmm. you call, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, in my circle, Mm -hmm. you know, I call her because she's a part of the family. You know, when I was diagnosed, she was. In the room when all my friends were told that this is what my journey was going to be. And many people don't have that. It's true. And so, but, but people have to reach out and build that. And I think in building their relationship, then the knowledge base gets to change for the person that's in your circle. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just talking to one another, but um, I'm grateful that the perspective has been shared and will continue to be shared but it goes back still to having those conversations and building those relationships with people. Yeah, um, people, the the critics, as, as I was reading through the various um, critiques on the movie, um, and, and a lot of, again, the black critics were saying, you know, it didn't go deep enough. It was it was more stereotypical because and maybe it, it, the point that, you, that both of you raised is that because we live it on a day to day basis, um, mm-hmm. it would have a very different impact on us. Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of, I think, shout out to Greg and Orphan Helpers to love them, what they do. <laughs> but um, I thought that... Tell us what Orphan Helpers is. Orphan Helpers is this um, nonprofit organization. He does a lot of work overseas in some of the, um, like, Honduras. I know my in friend... El Salvador. In El Salvador. Yep. So a friend of mine Guatemala. went on a couple of mission trips. And so what she and I used to do was raise money to give to Orphan Helpers. Um, okay. And his son, Adam, we worked with him a lot. But... Anyway, um, I think that's kind of, you know, I'm like, oh, well, that's normal. You know, the hate you get, it felt like a, I've seen this before. It's what we do or go through every day. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I think I personally, that wasn't at the top of my priority list to see that particular movie because it looked just like Like home real life for me. And Mm -hmm. so Greg articulated that very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I am going to go back, double back and. Go watch that. Take it's worth. I mean, it's. I'm. Please know that I. I fundamentally believe it's worth seeing Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And there were there there were some moments that I thought were absolutely beautiful moments. And love within a family was portrayed well. You Mm -hmm. know, sometimes if it's not the 
old school Cosby family. If it's not portrayed like that, yeah. then we're not we're not seen in in this nurturing environment where you can have a father who was incarcerated, who's a hundred percent invested in his children, children. and yes, faithful was. and loves his wife yeah. and you know like you it's almost as if we can only be one dimensional we're either the obamas or we are the felons but we we can't be the space in the middle as a mm-hmm. culture where mistakes could have been made but yet we have the richness mm-hmm. of the love that you may see in the obama family for instance so what i loved about the movie is that it did represent that very effectively i also really liked the fact that the in the movie, not as a spoiler at all, but uh, Star is dating a young um, European or Caucasian young man in the movie. Mm -hmm. And he did not make the kinds of mistakes that are often made in terms of the way in which you connect with a black woman. Mm -hmm. There was a moment inside of the movie where Star says that, is basically saying to him that, I am black. These are the things that are going on with me as a black person. And he says to her, I don't see color. And she responds back. If you don't see my color, you don't don't see see me. me." Mm -hmm. And he reached for her face and he said, I see you. And there was something in that that integrated both the love I have for you independent of your space and the love I have for you inside of your skin as if those met inside of that moment. And he said, I want to go meet your father tonight. And there was there are there are elements inside of the movie, layers inside of the movie, if you're really watching that speak to what most of us as people of color are looking for real as Dawn was saying real relationship that I don't have to hide a portion of who I am to be accepted and loved by you that I don't want you to to see races invisible I want you to love me inside of my skin inside of my culture and in that space we're still able to build real connections she even was to a point where which I just found just visually so interesting so she would walk out of the house in her uniform but with her hoodie on yep Okay, while she's leaving her home Mm -hmm. and as soon as she got in front of the school, school the hoodie would come off and it'd be in the full uniform. I mean, it was it was, it was just almost like symbolic of, of what having it is to change that we when do. Co- as, mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. As when we, we have do to as women switch. of color we or men of color all, all the time. time. Exactly. Leave we your do. black at home. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And or, as soon or as ask you for s- permission for your black in the moment. Yes. You know, yes. There yes. Is, or your and your mm-hmm. reference. Like, yes. okay, let me answer this as a as a real black person. And so you're 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 almost warning people that what I'm getting ready to say next. Mm-hmm. is not going to sound like tea and crumpets. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, like, so prepare yourself and I promise not to stay here long as to not offend. And are you okay with this? Are you okay? Yeah. Will that be all right? <laughs> okay. Because I want to know our relationship is still I, I intact. Wanna, yeah, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. When we're finished and you don't see me as angry. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not mad. Or aggressive. I'm just... I'm I just, just talk with I'm my just hands. Sharing. I'm just yeah. sharing. I, and think I know of that me, I'm a, Think mm-hmm. of me as Italian. I'm just moving my hands very expressively. Okay, that's all oh, it is. Oh, ladies, you guys are a mess. You know what? We're out of time. But Can you <laughs> believe this? It's what we do every it's day. It's what we do every day. It really mm-hmm. is. Thank you all so very much for joining me today. Always, Albion Lyons, always a Don pleasure. Hester, Allison Moore. Whoop, whoop. We look forward to seeing you guys again next month. And lots of food for thought from our Roundtable pundits today. If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, please visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. While you're there, please sign up for our EV newsletter. It's a once a week reminder reminder of upcoming shows we're on facebook so like us and i'm on twitter at barbara ham lee next week on another view could my alma mater bennett college be shutting its doors for good why is this hbcu for women in such trouble and what's being done to turn things around we're gonna have a really deep discussion about this next week our theme music was composed and performed by jay Sennett. lisa godley is our show producer todd washburn is our audio engineer and grace douglas and at our phones. I'm Barbara Hamley. Thank you so very, very much for listening to Another View. Another View.